So that had to have been one of the longest WWDCs in recent memory, going over two hours long, but Apple released all their new software, they released a bunch of new hardware products, and finally, they released their AR slash VR headset called the Apple Vision Pro. In this video, I wanna recap all of WWDC. Definitely look down in the description below because we will be covering everything that Apple talked about in individual videos. We will be installing the betas of iOS, iPadOS, and macOS for all the new versions of it. So definitely stay subscribed, but without further ado, Let's talk about WWDC 2023 because this thing, honestly, there was a lot of stuff to cover. Let's get into it. So instead of doing what Apple did, I'm actually gonna talk about the new Apple Vision Pro first because that's probably what everybody wants to hear about and they wanna get the ins and outs of what to expect with it. So first things first, this thing is going to start at $3,500 which means there could be a higher echelon of price, which means we don't know if it's gonna be upgradable like a Mac computer is when you buy it online, maybe more storage, more RAM, things of that nature. It is powered by Apple's M2 chip and Apple's brand new R1 chip, which is supposed to help with the whole spatial aspect of this actual headset. And Apple's calling this a spatial computing experience, and it's gonna be the first product that you look through, not look at, which again, Apple's great with their marketing, Apple's great with their wording, and how they actually present something like this, because again, an actual AR VR headset, as much as people wanna make it sound like it's gonna be the future or make it sound like it's gonna be a very cool thing to put on, at the end of the day, it's an isolating piece of technology that you put on your head that is 100% visible by other people, and if other people don't have it, then you're gonna put yourself in a situation where it's a very isolating experience, and Apple really wants to get through that and make it seem like, hey, this is not just for the single person, it can be used in conjunction with your real life and to supplement your current life, and again, Apple's leaning heavily into the augmented reality as well as the VR. And I'm gonna do a quick synopsis of all the features and things to expect with it because again, we're gonna have a full video explaining exactly what it does and all the ins and outs of it. It is driven based on eye tracking and also as well as your hands and voice. So it's gonna be very Siri based. It's gonna be very based on your eyesight, being able to look at things and be able to click on them quote unquote with a snap of a finger or a quick little tap of your actual fingers like that. So overall, it's going to be supposedly a very intuitive user interface and user experience overall. But let's see how it is in actual practice because I've seen a lot of these motion sensor activated kind of experiences and there's usually a lot to be kind of sought after after the fact. One of the biggest things Apple did with this experience overall, they wanted to make it inclusive to the people around you if those people weren't wearing this actual headset. So if somebody comes next to you, let's say you're in an immersive experience, they come next to you, Apple will unblur that little section of the screen itself to then make this person visible to you so you still feel like you're part of the actual world that you're in and not just in a virtual reality situation. So Apple's pushing that it wants to augment and supplement your, I guess, reality and not just completely remove you from it. And again, since it is powered by the M2 chip, this is a standalone computer. So if you wanna use it as a standalone computer, you can. Apple showed off a bunch of demos of people using Safari and Pages and Numbers and Excel and PowerPoint. It could run as its own computer, but then it also works in conjunction with an actual Mac. So if you have a MacBook Air, or MacBook Pro, you can use the actual headset to supplement the experience of using that Mac. And that's pretty much how everything that I wanted to mention on it. You know, the design itself is very unique. It's a headset at the end of the day. It's one glass panel on the front, one larger band on the back, the ability to kind of reuse or change those bands up. Apple took a lot of design cues from all of their different devices. You can see hints of the AirPods Max in there with that mesh material that's there. You see kind of design aspects or design features of the Apple Watch or the Apple Watch Ultra with the actual crown that can actually rotate and the dial that rotates, which the AirPods Max also had. So overall, Apple's taking a lot of design cues from everything that they've created in the past. So bringing it all together into what is now Apple's Vision Pro headset. And I'm excited to get my hands on it, but again, it's gonna come out early next year at $3,500, so it's gonna be very cost prohibitive. Let's see if it's actually gonna be worth that price point, but I wanna put that away, put that in a little silo, and now let's get into what everything else Apple announced. And now let's continue with the hardware or the rest of the hardware. Apple started off by introducing the new 15.3 inch MacBook Air, which has been rumored for a couple years now, or at least a couple months. And it's something that's gonna be a very welcome addition to the Apple lineup. And the biggest, and I believe the biggest feature of this new 15 inch MacBook Air is the price and then also what the price is doing to the rest of the MacBook Air lineup. So you still have the M1 MacBook Air at 999, the M2 MacBook Air, which started at 1299, the 13 inch version, is now going to be priced at 1099. And then this new 15 inch version is gonna be priced at 1299. So I think from a price point perspective, this is a great addition. I was thinking it was gonna be around 1499. It's probably gonna start still at eight gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of storage. So you're gonna to wanna to upgrade that if you see fit. But as a starting point, 1299 for just a much larger display and more screen real estate is a welcome addition for the M2 MacBook. 
at that 15 inch size. And what you're getting, obviously you're getting MagSafe, two USB-C slash Thunderbolt ports, a headphone jack, you get your four colors, which is the Midnight, Starlight, Silver, and Space Gray. You have the five millimeter borders, 1080p camera, six speakers, 18 hours of battery life, and 500 nits of brightness on that display itself. So again, you're getting the internals of the older M2 MacBook Air in a bigger screen size and a bigger form factor. So I think this one's gonna sell light hotcakes to a lot of people because not everybody needs the power of those MacBook Pros, but they want the larger form factor overall. So welcome addition to the lineup. And again, through the education store, you can get them for $100 off each one, putting it at $1199 for the brand new 15.3 inch M2 MacBook Air. This next one is gonna be very quick. Apple just put the new M2 Ultra chip into the Mac Studio, which makes it more powerful. I believe you get up to 192 gigs of RAM that could be used in there. You know, a bunch of kind of numbers that are kind of outside of what I would need to use it for, but basically it's going to be the most powerful Mac Studio yet, and you're gonna be able to do a lot with it, right? Render everything even faster, even more streams of 8K footage in real time, being able to kind of manage multiple projects simultaneously and render multiple projects at the same time. So just think of the Mac Studio that had the M2 Max and the M2 Pro, but just picture it being twice as fast or four x is fast overall comparatively so everything else outside of that is exactly the same they're just making a more powerful mac studio for the top five to ten percenters that need more power out of their mac studio but don't want to get the mac pro which is a perfect segue into the new product that apple's launching and this completely completes the transition from intel over to m power based macs and that's that the new mac pro now comes standard with the m2 ultra so the Mac Pro is still gonna have that same chassis, which is kind of interesting because I thought Apple would make it maybe a little bit smaller, but you can see with what they were showing that when they kind of opened it up and they showed what the internals looked like, there is a lot of empty space inside of that thing. So the cooling is gonna be great. The M2 Ultra is gonna run extremely smooth. It's gonna run probably relatively quiet, except for when you really push it at the end, it's gonna be able to be upgradable after the purchase, which is great to see. And for $6,000, I would hope that you're able to upgrade it after the fact. So again, same four factor, same $700 wheels if you wanna add the wheels to the MacBook Pro. You can still get it as a tower or as a RAID setup, but it's gonna have the M2 Ultra in it, and then you can actually upgrade it after the fact as well with additional accessories and additional power into that Mac Pro computer. So another welcome addition, and that finally completes this transition, like I mentioned earlier, from Intel computers to now M-series power computers, which makes everything just more efficient, more price effective, and as you can see now, two, three years later, Apple's price points are now much better, and the price to performance ratio on these computers are absurd. So now we got the hardware out of the way. So we got the brand new Vision Pro headset. We got the Mac Pro, the new Mac Studio with the M2 Ultra, as well as the M2 MacBook Air in the 15 inch variant. All welcome additions to the Mac lineup, but now those have to have software built into them. And iOS 17 is now right around the corner and the betas for the developers should be releasing as this video comes out. I will be installing the betas on my iPhone as well as the beta on my iPad. I usually avoid the Mac OS beta for the most part because that's the one that's usually the trickiest, but Jeff will have some coverage on Mac OS as well as some of the other operating systems. But just to give you a quick synopsis on what to expect, the name of the game with this one really wasn't game changing features, it was more quality of life improvements. It's gonna be tough at this point to kind of show off a game changing software feature. Everything is just gonna be all about personalization, making things easier to use, making everything more adaptable, making everything more user friendly, and again, just more quality of life improvements and stability improvements overall. But Apple still was able to squeeze out some more actual new features on iOS 17. Apple's bringing that lock screen animation or that lock screen form factor to more products inside of their actual ecosystem. So contacts now are able to be fully customized. So it's no longer a contact picture of somebody. You now have a contact like full screen image of them with a time, with their name, with any like foreground and a background. So a little bit more customization in there, which is nice to see. Two really cool features are the ability to have a live voice as well as FaceTime voicemail. So live voicemail is kind of exactly what it sounds like. So if somebody calls you, you don't wanna answer it, but you wanna see if it's important or not, it'll start showing you live dialogue and live text of what that person's voicemail is, and then you can decide to pick it up in real time. So if they're still on the phone, you can still answer them. And then FaceTime voicemail, exactly what it sounds like. Again, you can leave a video FaceTime voicemail if somebody does not answer your call iMessage got some improvements, so we got some new inline replies, so being able to quickly reply, so you no longer have to long press and then press reply, you can just kind of swipe and then reply to a specific message in a group chat. You can actually share your location much easier. You have this new check-in feature, so you can actually set checkpoints. So this is gonna be great for probably parents and you know middle school and high school kids when they have curfews, so make sure you tell me where you are at the end of the night 
or if you're staying at Johnny's house, make sure that you tell me where you are. You no longer have to do that because that's all automated at certain times of day. So if by 11 o'clock they're not at the places that they're supposed to be at, it'll let you know like, hey, this person is not there. They make sure they check in wherever they are right now. So live check-in, always a great feature. You also got a revamp iMessage kind of app section. So the app section used to live right above the actual text box or right above the keyboard itself. A little bit convoluted, a little bit confusing. Now it's all kind of consolidated into this one little plus button. So you're able to see everything that kind of comes up and get access to all of your iMessage apps right in front of you. And then Apple also added something called name drop to their airdrop feature. So I'm somebody that uses airdrop literally on a daily basis. So adding this name drop feature is going to be great. So you no longer have to like send somebody a text message and be like, Hey, what's your first and last name? You don't have to have that awkward conversation of, Hey, what's your name again? Right? So now you can literally just tap each other's phones and exchange contacts like that. Very similar to an NFC, like virtual business card or anything like that. But Apple just built it into their native OS. And that same tech is going to be coming to when you're sharing photos, when you're sharing videos and when you're showing sharing large photo libraries. Now, next up, we have iPadOS 17. The first thing you're gonna see is that we're gonna have interactive widgets. So widgets on your home screen, you can have interactive ones. They were showing checklists, they were showing kind of Quizlet study cards, and then also streak kind of widgets as well. So being able to interact with your widgets without having to open the application is something coming to the iPad, as well as the new lock screen customizations. So your lock screen can now be customized the same way that your iPhone lock screen can be customized. So so you can change the font of your clock, you can add widgets above the clock. You also have this new little side view, so it adds even more widgets on this left-hand side of your lock screen, which is reminiscent of the Today View, so they kind of brought it back, but not really. But again, just more and further customizations on the iPad lock screen is a welcome addition to the iPad. Some other things they brought over is that we finally get a health app dedicated to the iPad. So I've always been a big advocate for this because the health app is a great data glance at exactly what's going on with your health overall, but it's only on iOS. And I always thought to myself, the iPad is just such a bigger canvas. Like why not show those graphs and those data points on a much larger screen? They're finally bringing that health app over to iPad. So now you can view all of your health data directly on your iPad. They also added a new PDF built-in manager, so it's much easier to, they said they use machine learning to do autofills, to be able to use PDFs how they're intended to be used. So in my opinion, this is just gonna cannibalize every other PDF manager or PDF editor out there in the app store. So it's gonna be built in natively, so being able to kind of manipulate PDFs very easily, either directly on a PDF or even inside of your notes application in real time and share those PDFs and collaborate on those PDFs is gonna be a nice feature. And then also stage manager does get some improvements. So we are getting even more customization on the sizing of windows supposedly, as well as external camera support. So if your monitor has an external camera built in, or if you just have an external camera overall, you can now use it with iPadOS 17 and stage manager. Next up, let's talk about Mac OS and it's gonna be called Mac OS Sonoma. They added some, again, quality of life updates to Mac OS. And like we mentioned, we're gonna have a full video on this, but some of the things to take into account is that widgets are coming to Mac OS, whether you like it or not, they're coming and they're not just going to be kind of on that right hand side where you kind of click into them. Now they can kind of live kind of statically on your screen and they can stay there for as long as you want them to. But they don't want it to get in the way of other things that you're doing. So if you open up a window, it'll kind of go into this transparent mode so that it kind of goes away from your eyesight and your eye line, which is a great little kind of user experience addition to Mac OS. They also added a new game mode, so it kind of enhances your GPU and CPU to kind of push everything towards that game to make sure you get the best possible renders and the best possible frames per second when you are playing. They also lowered the latency when using PS5 and Xbox controllers on your actual Mac. So, you know, Apple's making a little bit of a push to actually get some good games and be able to have some good gameplay overall on Macs because that has been the laughing stock of Apple's kind of situation when it comes to gaming. The coolest part was the new video conferencing features, which kind of uses everything that Apple's been building on over the last couple of years. So basically pulling out the subject and making you move around, but automatically and, and with automation. So you don't have to kind of flick yourself around. So you kind of pull it around if you're doing a presentation, but then also there's a way to kind of pull you into a green screen kind of situation where your presentation is behind you, but you can point at it. And this is all done virtually with zero added tools and zero added apps needed to be done. And this is built in directly to some of your favorite video conferencing apps, not just FaceTime. You can use it with Zoom and some other ones as well. Next up, we have AirPods. So AirPods do get one new feature called adaptive audio. So it's for those situations where you want to use kind of that noise cancellation mode, but don't want to completely drown everything out and still want to have some transparency mode. I've seen other headphone manufacturers and companies do this, and some of them are a little bit gimmicky. Some of them work better than others. But the idea is, for instance, if you're on a train, you want to drown out the noise of the actual train and the monotonous kind of chatter behind you, but you want to be able to hear the conductor when they announce your stop. So that is where adaptive audio comes into play, allowing things to come through that you need to hear, but not actually 
letting everything else through. So that's a great addition, but let's see how it actually does in practice. We also got some new features when it comes to AirPlay and SharePlay. So AirPlay, now you have a new interface to actually use AirPlay at hotels, at least with hotels that are actually part of this ecosystem. So basically being able to easily sign in or easily AirPlay whatever you're watching on your iPhone, just by using a QR code and then whatever you're watching on your iPhone then goes to that hotel TV. And then SharePlay, we actually got something added to CarPlay. So if you're in a car with somebody and you're the one that likes to make sure that you're on the aux, you're the one playing the music, you can now allow people to access that same ecosystem with SharePlay by using SharePlay into CarPlay. So if let's say you have somebody in the back who just wants to play a song, you can just give them access to it from their phone and they can play their song on your car and then it goes right back to your kind of playlist or whatever you're listening to. Then we have tvOS. Now, I'm not a big tvOS user. I don't have an actual Apple TV, which is crazy to hear, but they did revamp it a little bit, right? So they added a new control center, so better UI, easier to use. They also added Find My for the TV remote. So if you use your iPhone as your TV remote, but you lose your actual Apple TV remote, you can use your iPhone to then track your TV remote built in, which is great to have. They're also bringing FaceTime over to the Apple TV, which is teach their own. Some people think it's gimmicky. Some people are going to be using it a lot, but you basically use continuity camera from your iPhone to be using your iPhone to then use it as a FaceTime camera, but be able to view it on your actual TV. So just a much larger viewing when you actually FaceTiming with one or multiple people. And now we're rounding off pretty much everything. The last couple of things that I wanted to share are watchOS. So watchOS is coming to obviously Apple watches, but you do get some new kind of redesigns, right? Apple wanted to change up how it looks and feels because overall, yes, we've got new additions and new features, but for the most part, Apple Watch has pretty much been the same experience from a user interface experience, right? The UI has pretty much been the same. So Apple wanted to change that a little bit. They added a new lock screen with portraits. So very similar to the lock screen customizations we're getting with iPad OS and we have had with iOS. But you also get the ability to add widgets and using the digital crown to actually have smart stacks kind of built in there. So let's say you wake up in the morning, it'll show you the weather. But if you're on a workout, it'll show you what your workout is doing. If you have a timer, it'll pop up the timer in the front of that smart stack to make sure it's visible. So just adding those widgets into watchOS is gonna be great. And then they also added a bunch of new cycling features, which again, I'm not a biker, but they did add a bunch of new cycling features to enhance your overall experience when biking using the Apple Watch. And then lastly, they did add the new journal app, which again, they're gonna be using it in multiple ways. The first way is with memories. So I'm a big fan of the memories that Apple produces in the photos app, but with journaling, it basically creates a memory using photos, using the location, using kind of like the apps that you've used, using what music you've played, and then it'll kind of group that together. And if you press on it, it'll kind of give you a prompt to kind of let you know like, hey, what are three things that you did? What are three things that maybe you didn't like about this trip? Or what was your favorite part of the trip? So then you can kind of start to keep track and start journaling these experiences overall, which I think is great and this ties in also perfectly into Apple's mental health game which they're trying to improve and kind of improve your stress levels so being able to track your stress levels and track them alongside of that journal is going to be great to have so Apple introducing all these new features now let's quickly talk about compatibility with all these softwares so when it comes to iOS 17 so this is going to be the first time they're going to drop the iPhone 10 completely off this list so the original iPhone 10 which is the first one that got that new redesign without the home screen will not support iOS 17. So you need an iPhone XS and XS Max or newer. It goes as low as the iPhone SE2 and SE3, but basically an iPhone XS or newer, and then as well as the iPhone SE2 or newer. Then when it comes to Watch OS 10, you need an Apple Watch Series 4 or newer, as well as both Apple Watch SE variations, as well as also obviously the Apple Watch Ultra. So if you have an Apple Watch Series 3, unfortunately Watch OS 10 will, will not be able to support Watch OS 10. So basically a seven year old Apple Watch will be able to support Watch OS 10. And then lastly for iPad OS 17, basically every single iPad Pro except for the 2015 original iPad Pro will support this. Any iPad Air 3 or newer will also support this. Any iPad mini fifth gen or newer will support iPad OS 17. And then finally, any iPad sixth generation or newer will also support iPad OS 17. So if you have anything older than that, unfortunately you will not be getting iPad OS 17. But that is pretty much the rundown of everything Apple spoke about. Again, this was a two hour keynote, which was crazy to think about. The new Vision Pro goggles or the Vision Pro headset with Vision OS is coming out. We have some new hardware with MacBook Air, the new Mac Pro completing the M series kind of transition from Intel to M chips. And then obviously we have iOS 17, iPadOS 17, and all the corresponding softwares with some new added features along those. So 
Let me know in the comment down below what you think of Apple's keynote. Was it everything that you expected? Are you excited about Apple's new kind of venture into this product category of AR and VR headsets? I'm interested in it, but in a way where it's like, I kind of want to see what happens. Apple definitely convinced me to at least try it out, but is it something I'm going to use on a daily basis to get more work done or to replace a secondary or third monitor? I don't really know. Time will tell as we start to play with this thing, but overall, I'm excited with everything that Apple brought out. But let's definitely discuss in the comments down below. If you did make it to the very end, leave a little dolphin so I know that you made it to the end. And if you guys want to watch some more coverage on WWDC, click on one of these videos right here. But until next time, I'm Fernando. I'm out of here, everybody. Peace.